Okay, so for those of you who don't know, Traffic Ops is sort of like the center of an ATC deployment, and interacting with its API is how you change configuration of other components and how you basically set up all your CDNs. So for the past few months, the Traffic Ops working group has been meeting every once in a while to discuss changes to the API that... Um, we feel address tech debt and limitations of the current system. So this is going to be sort of walking through what those meetings look like, uh, what we discussed, and the considerations and anything we learned along the way. So we started meeting in December. Uh, we've got consistent attendance from four people. There have been meetings with more, but consistently it's been about four people. And we meet for just an hour to discuss a design document that lives as a pull request in my fork of the traffic control repo, which was, it was a really nice way to collaborate because it lets people leave comments on like lines that they think should be worded differently or just taken out altogether, you know, on a line by line basis on the pull request. And uh, so far, these meetings have resulted in two merged blueprints, which are just a statement of intent to do something basically that's used by the traffic control project. And we had one blueprint that was rejected and one that's out there in kind of limbo right now. So that's our progress so far. And mainly we talked about things that can be grouped into two different categories. There's things that deal with just uh, all around best practices that don't have anything to do with specific objects or specific endpoints. And they're just sort of quality of life improvements for interacting with the API. And then the more controversial and by far harder to tackle aspect is the data model itself, looking at the objects that are received and returned by the API and seeing how those could possibly be improved. And the reason for that is like the traffic ops API builds up out of necessity over the years. If you need a new thing, then you just add it. So we think it can be beneficial to take a step back every once in a while and ask yourself if you were designing all of the things you know you need today from scratch, what might you do differently? And are there any steps you can take to move in that direction? So as far as best practices, one of the most basic things that we sort of codified, this was sort of an unwritten rule in traffic control. It's a problem that existed in very old versions of the Traffic Ops API, but that people all generally agreed were bad and had resolved not to do again. And we basically just wrote down that rule. So one of the things in that category is using HTTP request methods incorrectly. You can see here the uh, get delivery services, XML ID, blah, 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 slash delete path was a get request that deleted SSL keys, which is not only something that doesn't make the most intuitive sense it could make, but it's actually a vulnerability in cross-site request forgery attacks. Because if you can get a user to click on this in an email, they think they're opening a web page, but they're actually destroying some information somewhere. Uh, another improvement with regard to HTTP request methods is if you look down in the box for the example put request, a delivery service is one of the most common objects to manipulate in the Traffic Ops API. And they have several dozen fields depending on what context you're looking at them in. Uh, this is just sort of a stripped down example of some things that could be problematic. But if you wanted to update just this 
array here, consistent hash query params, and say you wanted to remove the entries it has and replace them with something else, you have to put up the entire representation of the delivery service because put is an idempotent method. And if you omit fields, then you're implicitly setting them to null because the way the parser works on the server is it doesn't differentiate between undefined and null. So if you just want to change that one field, you still have to push up this representation and make sure you get all these fields right. XML ID is an identifier for a delivery service that's used, as you can see above, in request paths, but it's mutable because they have another identifier. So if you get that wrong, you can break a lot of things. In fact, that doesn't even only break the API. That would also break routing and caching. Uh, display name is kind of innocuous. Long description, a delivery service has three of those and they have no text length, which makes the payloads for put requests gigantic. And raw remap text is another thing where if you change this, you can break not only this delivery service, but possibly others. Now, if you compare that to a patch request, this is it. This is the entire thing with nothing cut out for space. You specify only what you want to change. This is something that people have wanted for a long time, but we didn't have the ability to support it until recently. In fact, I think that might even still be pending. I'm not sure if the e-tags pull request has been merged yet. But the new API best practices, which have been merged, that was one of the blueprints that was approved, specify that endpoints should try to implement this. So moving forward, we should be able to do that. Makes things safer and easier. Uh, the API best practices document also specified what all of the response codes are for and what things you're not allowed to do with them, which is important because this here is a mistake that I made actually in one of my pull requests that was pointed out. If you request delivery services, what you get back isn't a list of all the delivery services that exist. They're implicitly filtered by the ones that you have access to. So I was writing some endpoint, I don't remember what it was, but you, required, you were required to identify a delivery service as part of it. So because they were omitted from the response of all delivery services, I thought it'd be appropriate to send back a 404 and pretend it doesn't exist. But that's kind of a worse UX and you can discover which delivery services exist anyway by trying to create some with their IDs. And then it'll tell you a delivery service with that ID already exists. So it doesn't really provide anything to hide that information from the user. And it kind of harms the ability to build things on top of the API. So I know just for me, it was useful to be able to write these things down. This is something that has been discussed, I believe only on pull requests up until the point it was written in the API best practices document, is that if a component is failing because the traffic ops API acts as a proxy for a lot of other services, you don't want to expose that those are failing. So instead of sending back like a bad gateway response, you should just send back an internal server error. So that way you don't have information that you don't need. And that's available in the log files for administrators who would want to be able to fix the problem anyway. And just as one more example, just to be compliant with the HTTP spec, when you create an object on the server, the new best practices guidelines recommend that you use 201 created, whereas previously we used 200 okay, which is a pretty boring change, I guess. But it's one that was made. Another thing that we saw a lot of in older API versions is the exposure of a relationship as its own table. 
so if you had like we have topologies now uh talk was just given about that i think like an hour ago and under similar circumstances as other api endpoints have been created what you might see is like a delivery services underscore topologies endpoint for delivery services that use topologies you would interact with their relationship through this endpoint in the api because there's a join table and the join table demands that there be an endpoint to interact with it but to illustrate how this can get weird let's just look at assigning service servers to delivery services and vice versa each one can be assigned to many or none of the other so you can look at a server's particular delivery services manipulate them that way we have this endpoint where you can manipulate the servers of a delivery service which is all fine so far but delivery services can also be identified this way so we have this endpoint which isn't the worst thing either but now we get a little bit weirder we also have this delivery service underscore server endpoint where you can manipulate the assignment the linking between any given delivery service and any given server we also have this, which is not the same thing because the representations it uses are entirely different, but it also still serves the same purpose as the one with the underscore. And then we have this, which shows you all of the servers that can be assigned to a delivery service, which is essentially just all of those that are not already and are of a type that can be assigned. So we've got all of these different ways to do things and they all use different data types in their requests and response, which makes them hard to switch between. So if you wanted to leave one behind, it gets a little hard for clients because they have to update everything. And you don't wanna to have to maintain all of these. So there's some friction there. But the new API guidelines say, don't do this, which Thankfully, we're moving to topologies instead because to try to fit servers as a property of delivery services would be insane. The payload sizes would increase by orders of magnitude. Another minor thing is that a lot of API responses in, the, in version one of the API will show you these strings as success messages. And if this were designed today, what it would look like according to the guidelines in the docs is something more like this, where it returns the actual object you made. And these aren't real key. Oop, these aren't real keys for anybody having a heart attack right now. And it returns this alerts array, which is the standard way that traffic ops endpoints are supposed to communicate client hints. So that way you can write more robust tests because you don't want to key off of exactly what this text is because it's just a client hint and it should be able to change. And now let's talk about the data model changes that we were looking at and were proposed. So one of the big concerns in the current data model or yeah, one of the big concerns in the current data model is that it's tied very directly to database tables. Like you remember earlier, the delivery service underscore servers endpoint is literally just a window into the delivery service underscore server table. And when you expose things like that, it tends to cause breakages like in the API guidelines, like where it says you shouldn't have relationships as objects if you can help it. Because if you have a join table and you're exposing all your database tables, then you're exposing that relationship as an object, things like that. And in general, the, the idea here is that an endpoint should be designed so that you can fulfill some purpose and not just to expose access to some stored data which is an important distinction. 
So a lot of objects in the Traffic Ops API have IDs that are numeric and also names that you can't really use to uniquely identify them, but they must be unique. So that's not always the case. But when that is the case, it makes it makes it very difficult to remember what kind of uh, ident or what the identifier is for an object you're trying to interact with. It also makes it non-deterministic. If you have scripts that set up environments and you want to create a bunch of objects, then the IDs you get back are all in implementation detail and you can't count on just the name to uniquely identify things. But using names as IDs also solves what's called the n plus one query problem, or at least partially, which is where if you had a topology on a delivery service, for example, identified by ID, but they also have names that are unique, what you want to show to the user in a UI is the name, because the ID means nothing to them. They know what the name means. So if you get back a list of delivery services, then you've made your one request. And then for each of those delivery services, you have to go look up that topology ID, which is where the N comes from. So ideally, you want your payloads to be complete enough to build a UI on top of so that you only have to make one query instead of N plus one. It makes things easier and reduces load on the server. Uh, another possible problem with the data model that we looked at was trying to reduce what what I would call harmful levels of reflection. So traffic ops in the API has types which are customizable fully. You can delete types, you can create types, and you can modify types. Type is a type of data. So they also have a property on them called use in table. And until version three of the API, you were able to create types of arbitrary use in table values, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the table in which this type is used. So that ties the database again directly to the API. It makes it very difficult to make changes to the, to the database because it's now a part of our versioned API. And just to illustrate how confusing this can get, let's just look at the process for finding out if a server is an edge tier cache server. The most obvious thing to do is check its type. Uh, because of some of the reasons I mentioned on the last slide, you can't always trust the name returned by the API. Sometimes it'll lie to you under very specific circumstances the true identifier of a type is its ID. So you look it up by its ID. And then you check to see if it has the type name edge, which exists when you install traffic control. But like any type in API 2.0 and lower, it's totally mutable. So you can change that name. You can even delete the type if it's not being used by anything. So if that doesn't match, then a lot of places in the code will use this regular expression. I think some of them actually also only check to see if the literal word edge is contained just somewhere in the type name. But this is, I think, the most common way I've seen it. But also, that's not the only way to check if a cache server has the edge to your type. A lot of places don't have, I guess it's not fair to say that they don't have access to this information, but they don't look at it. A lot of places check the profile instead, and there's a reason for that. So when you're checking if an edge to your cache, or if a cache server is an edge to your cache server, then you look at its profile, and you look its profile up by its ID, and then you check its profile type. A profile type is not a type. It's a it's immutable. You can't make more. You can't modify the ones that exist. And that's why a lot of places will check the profile instead. Because if it's an ATS profile, then you know you don't need to look at the type name of the profile any 
deeper than this. This is for an Apache traffic server instance. It's a cache server. But that doesn't tell you if it's an edge tier cache server. So you have to go a little bit deeper. And a lot of places will then check the profile's name matches this pattern. So that's a, a lot of steps to go through to try to figure out if any given server is an edge tier cache server. It suffers from the n plus one problem. And it also sort of muddies the waters surrounding what a type is. Another problem that you see a lot in the data model is field abuse, in air quotes. If you have any basically unstructured text area on, a, on an object, it'll get used to house business logic, which is parsed by some third party tool somewhere because they didn't have anywhere else to store that information, but they needed it. And that makes it difficult to upgrade things. It makes it difficult to change the data model because if you change the form of something, if you start validating a field that you haven't been validating before, then all of a sudden somebody's entire work pipeline is just busted. All right, now let's talk about the considerations when making changes and any lessons we learned while doing that. And starting as a lesson, sometimes you might not think something will break the API, but it will. And as an example, remember earlier I said that creation now uses the 201 create, or it's, it's recommended that you use the 201 created response code just to be compliant with the HTTP spec. You wouldn't think that would break anything, but it does because the Go client in API versions 2.0 and 1.0 looked at the response code for any re given request sometimes and decided whether it was a success or a failure based on whether or not it was literally equal to 200 OK. So you can't change the response code in old versions because people who are using those old clients will now see this success code, but consider it a failure. And that's why when the server's endpoint was rewritten, only the API v3 uh, handler for the endpoint used this new response code. And the old ones still use the old response code. Something you have to consider when you're looking at why or how to fix something that you think is bad is why did people feel the need to do it? And a big example of this is the types problem that I talked about earlier. People created these types because they wanted to be able to group servers together. Like if you have a cache server, an edge to your cache server that's running Ubuntu 18 and you have some other cache servers that are running Ubuntu 20, you might make a type that's like edge underscore Ubuntu 18 and edge underscore Ubuntu 20. And that way you can keep all of your cache servers grouped together nicely so that if you need to do bulk operations on them that depend on what operating system version they're running, you can do that very easily. So the solution we came up to that was tags. It's exactly what it sounds like. You just put a tag on something. So instead of needing to create a custom type, you can just say this has the Ubuntu 18 tag. So it's, you can't just create like a, a database upgrade that says, well, if it fits the current criteria for an edge tier cache server, then make its type name just edge and then take away people's ability to create new types because there's a real use case for the reasons that people are doing these things. Uh, tags also could help with field abuse, but as it turns out, that's not actually the main reason that people put business logic in there. It's not for grouping things. They want key value pairs, but that's beside the point. Uh, another example of this is profiles. And basically a profile is a collection of parameters that you assign to some server or delivery service, but we don't talk about that. So you can create arbitrary configuration on these servers. 
Um, most often, these parameters being associated with a server represent some line in some configuration file. So basically, you can tune just arbitrary parts of a cache server's file system with this, which is a lot of power. It also means that you can't validate anything, which makes it a little bit of a headache to work with sometimes, especially in the cases where the parameters don't actually correspond to a line in a configuration file, which is the case for a lot of monitoring properties of cache servers. So when you're looking at trying to do more validation on these values because they're they're not currently valid, validated because they can't be because they can represent arbitrary concepts you can pull out certain things but you you can't rework the idea entirely because there is a good reason for it and it does provide a lot of power Uh, one of the things learned along the way while designing it was initially this this whole design document was supposed to eventually wind up as uh, as its own blueprint as a pull request into the main repository. But clearly, there were a lot of things looked at, and there were a lot of proposed changes, and not all of them have been approved. Not all of them going forward will be approved. Some of them will be changed and some will be dropped entirely. So you have to make your changes to the API very small, basically as small as you can, so that people can digest them easily and also quickly, because you don't want to read through an entire wall of text. There's a couple, couple of examples of where this was done. Uh, this is a prop. Um, th this this was actually shot down. This was made into a blueprint, but this is the one that was rejected. I still think, though, that it illustrates the concept of breaking things into small chunks very well. So basically, today, we have servers, which encompasses just any kind of server that has anything to do with the CDN, because Traffic Ops is a system of record for all servers. So if you have a machine that just runs Grafana, it's in there. It's right next to the traffic routers. So the idea was to break them up into all of these disparate types, which, like I said, was deemed to be just too excessive. But the plan at the time was to introduce these each separately. So instead of having one proposal for breaking up all the servers, you put in a proposal for breaking traffic portals out. And then you have just traffic portals and then everything else. And then you can extract things one at a time it's a lot easier to do, and it's a lot easier to read and review. So, And the other example is uh, delivery services, which I've talked about a lot. So you can probably tell that they were thought about a lot. And delivery services have lots of properties. These are just like two things that were looked at. Uh, this top one was actually approved. And this bottom one is pending. but. The point is that they were done separately instead of submitting a giant blueprint to change everything about a delivery service all at once. And the hardest lesson to learn, for me at least, was that knowing something is bad isn't enough to get rid of it. Because sometimes you have a set of power that just cannot be replicated in what you might consider to be a more sane way. And I think the poster child for this is the AnyMap delivery service. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say anything truly positive about AnyMaps. I think neutral is as positive as it gets. But the thing is, most people generally agree that this is going to be around for the foreseeable future. Because what an AnyMap delivery service is, is instead of doing any routing through normal CDN means, you just put a raw line somewhere in an Apache traffic server configuration file, and then clients use that to do their thing, which makes it pretty dangerous and pretty obscure because the way that raw line is handled is different for this type of delivery service than any other type. But because of the way it works, you're able to do some extremely complex things with very small changes. And there's just 
no way that I at least or anybody that I talked to in the working group about it could think of to replicate that. So it's going to stick around. And finally, doing something better can sometimes mean that you have to put in some weird logic. Like for the all CDN. So servers currently represent every kind of server. And all servers must be in some CDN. However, for some types of servers, that doesn't make the most sense because their operation isn't restricted to a single CDN. The most obvious one is Traffic Portal, which is the UI for Traffic Ops. So by design and definition, it doesn't operate within a single CDN because it shows you all of them. It shows you everything you have permission to see. It's the UI into the entire ATC system. But you can't just get rid of the all CDN. The all CDN being this special string that you use to name a CDN that encompasses all CDNs. In every, almost every sense, it behaves pretty much exactly like a CDN of any other name. But specifically, there's a lot of code that looks at CDN names and does things differently, or sometimes not at all, if their name is all. Because this is just meant for grouping things that don't truly belong to any one CDN. And you can't really get rid of it immediately, because if you do that, you break old API versions. You can't give back null somewhere where null used to not be allowed. That'll break chain, that'll break clients. So even though you can make data changes that make the all CDN not necessary, it has to stick around for at least a major version. And that's, uh, that's all the changes and lessons that we learned. The source code for this presentation is available on GitHub if you click on it on the slide. So, Sweet. Thanks, Brennan. Um, we have a couple of questions that popped into the chat. Uh, Rob asked, how does that interact with the with compound keys example given host name and port? And he's talking about names, not IDs. Yeah, so like I said, there are some cases where you can't identify something purely by name like in the case of servers where we want host names to be able to be the same for two servers so that you can run multiple services on the same server. And uh, the way the best practices document handled that was if you have an object, it must be identifiable by one property. So it says not to use compound keys. And that's why servers would still have an ID. Gotcha. Okay, and then the next question, um, are there recommendations around what to use for API tracing since there are multiple API versions that work together? Uh, API tracing in what sense? Well, we're gonna have to wait for Roger Suari to type there. <laughs> okay. um, I'm, I'm guessing She's asking how to know which version to use um, on each component, maybe? Uh, well, I guess in that case, what we've done is we support three API versions at a time, a legacy version, a stable version, and the version under development. And when the version under development becomes a stable uh, version, you just change the version that the components use. Yeah, what APIs, yeah, in the sense that when portal calls an API and ops calls other components, how do we tell what's going on? Um, what APIs get invoked for a workflow? Uh, you can find which API version is being called in the logs. Yeah, the logs have the full request path. So the API version, I don't show it in the URLs because it gets tedious, but the URLs always include slash API slash version number at the front. So it's always very explicit. Does UI show us if something failed? No, um, I'll let you answer that, Brennan. It doesn't show you 
it shows you if a request failed because it's your fault, but if it's because something's going wrong on the server, the UI just says 500 internal server error, and that's all the information that the client gets back. Yeah, yeah we use the logs for all of that information. Uh, we, we pipe all of the access logs into our uh, login analytics system. Another question? What time is the next session? 12.55, okay. In my past life, I've seen microservices log activities that is pushed into a log stash or OSO. And then there is a trace ID, so we can look at a single place to tell what happened. Or so yeah, like like we were saying, um, you can definitely uh, have some sort of application that takes all the logs and put them puts them into a, a system. Um, we happen to do that with our internal logging analytics system, um, but you could do that with like an Elk type solution or Splunk. Yeah, and uh, requests. If you're concerned about seeing like a bunch of requests in the logs because they're all being serviced at the same time, requests do have an ID, which I think might be what you mean by trace ID. So you can associate the correct log lines with the correct request. All right, well, thanks again, Brennan. Um, we're out of time. We can, any more questions, we can just move them to Slack. Um, but really appreciate it, Brennan. This was really yeah, helpful. No problem. Um, cool. See All right, see ya.